Ben Harvey, Professor Ben Harvey from the Shimoda uh, Institute of Marine Science, uh, the part of the United States of Cuba. Ben is a very good friend and collaborator of us. So we're doing a lot of work together at the CO2 SIP in Shimoda, but also in Wotoroshima and New Caledonia and some places around the world. So, and uh, he graduated from, <laughs> I cannot pronounce this university name. <laughs> so from Aber Smith University in UK. Uh, and then after one year of postdoc <laughs> in the same university, he'd become an assistant professor at the Shimoda Marine Research Center, where he's there now science uh, tw uh, 2016. So um, Ben is one of the first pioneers together with Jason and uh, other people at Sylvan to use natural analogs to study future climate, in this case, CO2 and natural acidification. So uh, without further ado, I will give you uh, the floor. So Yoko, I need to switch. Uh, just uh, another thing, so for you guys here, you can ask questions after the talk. For the people on Zoom, if you can, they can hear me, you can either speak up or maybe type your question in the chat or raise your hand, okay, after the talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. So, yeah, so it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you for Tim and uh, the group for hosting me here in OIST. It's slightly scary to realize that I'm the first one to give a talk live within the uh, pandemic, but there we go. So the, as Tim introduced, so the, the area of my research and the talk today is going to be very much focused on ocean acidification. And I have a particular interest in kind of understanding how entire kind of communities and ecosystems are going to be affected by these changes. So kind of across the board within our oceans, we're increasingly seeing these quite drastic and abrupt changes to the communities and ecosystems. Now, this can be attributed to a number of different sort of anthropogenic effects, but we're starting to increasingly see a lot of the sort of quite similar patterns where we're starting to shift from these very complex communities, whether from kelp forests or coral reefs, into much more simple and degraded systems. And increasingly, we're seeing that they are being dominated by a turf algae. So just very simple uh, filamentous algae that will form mats or carpets across large areas. And so a very sort of simple system. Now we're concerned about this because this overall brings about a loss within the habitat itself, the structural complexity, and we also see a loss generally in the biodiversity and functioning of those systems. So as I'm sure majority of you will be familiar with, we're having the ocean acidification ongoing within our oceans. So the CO2 being drawn down from the atmosphere into the oceans is causing fundamental changes to the carbonate chemistry. The general sort of idea we have with this is that as long as we know how much CO2 is going to be coming into our oceans, the chemistry is actually really quite simple. It's incredibly predictable. So we know exactly what's going to change for the various ions and everything for the carbonate chemistry. But the tricky part is then taking that very predictable chemistry and trying to work out what happens with the biology. So how the ecosystems and communities are going to be affected. So when we look at these kind of general biological changes associated with ocean acidification, we have the generalized pattern and observation so far that many calcifying organisms are going to find it very difficult to calcify or produce their skeleton structures and tests. But on the flip side, we're actually going to have some primary producing species are going to benefit from the addition of either the aqueous CO2 or the availability of bicarbonate ions. And so therefore, this makes it quite tricky because we have this kind of imbalance within the community where some are going to be very negatively impacted by the effects of ocean acidification, whereas some others are actually going to potentially benefit or somewhere in the middle be unaffected. And so it becomes quite difficult, even just logistically, to try and understand how communities are likely to respond to these effects. So 
one of the ways that we go about this is by using volcanic CO2 seeps. So these are systems where due to local volcanic activity, there is a release of carbon dioxide through the seabed. This then gives us a localized area where it is experiencing the conditions we expect for ocean acidification. And obviously this is not how ocean acidification happens, but this gives us a natural laboratory of sorts to be able to look into those effects. The site that I predominantly use, because it's about one and a half, two hours by boat away from the marine station I work at, is on Shikine Island. So this is a relatively small island, one of the Tokyo Islands, and it's next to Nijima, if you've heard of that one. Within the area, almost pure carbon dioxide is released from the seabed. And this allows us to make comparisons between this area where we have the CO2 to an adjacent bay outside the influence of the seep. So predominantly, we're using these two areas. So we have this area around here. So this is actually just outside of where the bubbles are, but we have a sort of good conditions of what we expect the end of the century to be like. So around 900 to a thousand parts per million. And then we use this adjacent bay further around here, which is completely outside the influence of the seep and lets us know for the same you know, temperature, oxygen, latitude, everything, what the community will normally look like. We can then make comparisons between these two sites and get an idea of how ocean acidification will be causing these impacts. We know that these conditions are temporally quite stable because we've deployed a number of different uh, sensors and sort of monitoring equipment. And so just to give you an example, you can see over about a one month period here, you have in the blue, the 300 parts per million control or reference site. And below this in the red, an idea of the pH in our high CO2 or ocean acidification site. I apologize, I may jump between the names a little bit. And so this means that we can start to actually carry out quite long-term experiments both looking at those species that are present within these sites, but also using it to actually carry out experiments as well. So we can deploy organisms or transplant organisms to get a better idea of what's going on. So the first observation we have is that when you look within the normal conditions, this is our present day site, we have a mix of corals and algae forming the kind of main habitat of the site. Once you go into the high CO2, this gives way to much more simple organisms, generally the turf algae that I talked about previously. And this is actually relatively uniform. And so, whereas we then see lots of sort of associated biodiversity in our control, we have far less kind of going on with our high CO2 site. And so overall, we're seeing this regime shift from the complex to the simple, and overall a general loss in the habitat. When we look at this a little bit more sort of quantitatively, we can look at how the composition of the community for the habitat changes as the pH declines. So on here we have on our left-hand side is our present day pH conditions, and on our right side is our ocean acidification end of condition and end of century conditions. What we can see is that with very small declines in pH, we almost entirely lose the corals from the site. And then within the red, we see increasingly the turf algae goes from actually very little cover to an almost total coverage within the site. Other macroalgal species then decline as a consequence because we're using this as a percentage cover. But generally, we see this sort of regime shift happening quite abruptly. Now, obviously, the concern for this is that a lot of this change is happening in, in a relatively small change of pH. And so there are concerns that this is a problem that could be happening mid-century rather than the end of the century. So 
what a lot of my research therefore focuses on is trying to understand how this, this simplification and change in the community comes about to understand how the biodiversity and composition of the community is uh, being affected and to try and get a handle on some of the responsibilities of some of these mechanisms. So one of the first things we want to understand when looking at how a community changes is to consider the community succession. So here we're talking about when you have a bare rock or a bare substrate, how that community will develop over time and reach its kind of final um, sort of uh, state, its climax community. Typically, because of the latitude of Shikine, which is kind of between the sort of subtropical and temperate, we see that you will have an increase slowly of sort of CCA, sorry, uh, crustose coralline algae coming in, and then you'll get various other macroalgae and coral settling within the site. And so when we then consider how this succession can be impacted by a stressor, such as ocean acidification, we normally consider that there's two ways in which it happens. The first we call turnover is the proper name. And this is just where the composition of the community just heads off in a different direction. So if you consider succession as just the replacement of species over time, you just see completely different species entering the site. And the other we have as a possibility is nestedness. And so this would be where the very sensitive species are being lost. And so only the kind of robust tolerant ones are left from a kind of greater possibility. So you see a, a subset of the potential ones. And so sort of with this in mind, we wanted to look at a couple of different stages to understand how the succession was coming about. So on the first one, we wanted to look into the very short term. And so along with a PhD student from New Zealand, we carried out some experiments using some persplex plates. And then over a three week period, we collected them every five days to see how the prokaryotic and eukaryotic communities would be affected. We looked at this in terms of using meta barcoding. So quite just a simple design with 16S for the prokaryotic and 18S for the eukaryotic. And we carry this out in both the two sites I mentioned previously. So our kind of present day and our high CO2 seep site. Then looking at some of the more kind of longer term, we also did a uh, study that I carried out over two years in which at different sort of time points. So here after two months, four months, nine, 18 and two years, some other sort of meta barcoding where we're moving away from the kind of initial biofilm and actually moving towards quite climax communities where you have very developed um, macroalgae as well as the fauna that's actually using it as a habitat. So what we found on that first one was that we actually have a clear distinction in the community composition. So in case anyone is unfamiliar with this plot, if a point is close to another point, they are very similar in terms of the community. If they're further apart, they are more dissimilar. And so you would expect points from the same site to be close together. And if there's a big difference, they will be further apart. So what we see for both the prokaryotic and eukaryotic, where we have the prokaryotic on the left, is that they are entirely divided. On the left here, you have the reference communities, and on the right, you have the high CO2, and you have exactly the same within the eukaryotic. So this kind of follows our model of a turnover. The two sites, so when the control and the high CO2, they go off in different directions. There's not some sort of subset, there's just completely different composition in these sites suggesting there's very, very big changes. We also see that there's some changes over time. So you get not only different community, but actually even over a three week period, you actually see the changes are separate between the two sites. On the longer term, this was the tiles that were carried out after about 18 months, just to give you an idea of what they look like. So here on the left, we have our present day communities where when the tiles are lift, you can see that they're like very uh, heavily covered within algae. And there's actually a nice sort of mix of diverse different types of macroalgae and actually various uh, sort of sessile invertebrates and everything on it as well. On the right hand side in our high CO2, we actually see that we have that very simple turf algal system. That's mostly just a single species that covers 
the majority of the tile. And although you do have some sort of sessile and motile invertebrates, it's a much more simple community. So when again, we look um, at the meta barcoding of this, so this is just um, looking, focusing on the habitat forming species. So we can see on the left here, we have an indication of the diversity where blue is our reference, red is our high CO2. We can see that for the diversity, generally you have lesser diversity in the ocean acidification. When you look at the evenness, you can see we have lower evenness in the high CO2. So when we're talking about evenness, if within a community you have a similar proportion of the different species, so let's say it's like 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, you would have a high evenness. Whereas if you have a low evenness, this suggests that one species is dominating and is having a much bigger coverage or kind of relative abundance compared to the rest. So our lower evenness in the high CO2, it kind of tracks with our story. It says the fact that we've got this turf algae, this very simple low diversity system that's just taking over and representing a large proportion. When we look at it in terms of complexity, where by looking at the types of uh, species we have within our um, meta barcoding, we can attribute scores to them of how much they actually provide habitat. And so we can look and kind of see again, it's the same story kind of coming up more and more. So even at this stage, we again have this separation in the composition. So what this kind of means overall is that, you know, at those early stages of like five days or so, the community composition has diverged. And even when we look after like two months, four months, two years, they have remained diverged. And so we see that the communities have just gone off in a completely different direction. When we actually consider as well the properties of a community, it's not just important to know the kind of composition of you know, what species are there. It's also important to consider the role that those communities or ecosystems play. And so one of the things we did for that longer term experiment is to take those tiles, those recruitment tiles, and to measure what their gross primary production was, how much oxygen are they actually producing, and how much respiration. Generally, you would expect a more developed community to have higher rates in both respiration and production because they're able to produce more. Generally, there's more biomass. And so generally for humans, it's good to have a very high functioning ecosystem because that's the sort of things that we are reliant on. Now, what we could see was that again, with our reference community, you're seeing this development over time as they become higher coverage, more species, more diversity. And so, when we look at our rates, the rates are higher after two years, both for respiration and productivity. You know, the high respiration implies that there's lots of invertebrates associated with it within this habitat. So, you know, it's quite a productive system. But when you look into the red for our high CO2, it hasn't really changed that much between two months and two years. And so you know that perhaps when this community is starting to develop, it reaches a certain kind of low state and it's locked in and doesn't really change much beyond this. And so, you know, this is obviously quite concerning because it means that not only does it seem to have lower, lower biodiversity and complexity, the kind of the things we rely on it on. So even though it's got lots and lots of a primary producer, it's not doing very well in terms of its actual functioning. So, so when we consider, therefore, this community succession, we're kind of like, all right, we'll do the communities just go off in different directions. Yeah, it seems to be that if there is going to be some bare rock available, then just a completely different set of species will come in under the uh, OA conditions and will then end up at this very simple turf community. But obviously, if we actually think about a regime shift, it's not that there is this bare rock that then slowly develops into a community. You have an existing community there and it's going to be actually changed over time. So you have to try and think about how ocean acidification will actually impact an existing community. So we need to start thinking about some of those other mechanisms that could be responsible. So one of the things to think about is obviously there's going to be some sensitivities. 
So one of the things we were quite interested in was the fact that with cross-dose coral and algae, it's very well established that they are quite negatively impacted by ocean acidification. <coughs> but there's actually not much information on how the actual diversity of these systems are being changed because no one's bothered to look. They've gone in and they've just used a visual identification to try and work out what species they are. And turns out after some studies, people are not very good at IDing coralline algae visually and they have to use molecular techniques. And so when we carried out a survey, we not only found that there are way more species than were previously expected, but that actually most of them didn't even hit a match within sort of GenBank and other sort of like uh, places. Now, obviously there's a, perhaps a little bit obvious in that if it's not been studied taxonomically, of course, there's not so many sequences that have been placed, but it still implies that the work has not been done. And so we found that actually 52 out of the 60 species we found didn't match to anything in particular. And when we put them to the various orders and things, we could see that there were, you know, some corallines, which are the most dominant type of the, 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 the orders, were still present to a point. Many of the others were actually lost. And so overall, this means that probably the biodiversity loss of coralline algae, as an example of other ones, has probably been underestimated previously. And so there's actually been way more species lost than was realized. Now, one of the other things that we, we obviously have, so this could be based on just its sensitivity, so that perhaps corallines are lost because they're sensitive, but you're also gonna have lots of interactions between organisms that are coming in. So that turf algae that is dominating the site, is not just gonna be residing on its own, it's gonna impact other species at the same time. And so what we will often see is that actually it will start to overgrow or even smother other organisms. So what you may or may not be able to see, so this is a small Acropora coral. It's probably about this sort of size, so not very big, but clearly it had been able to actually grow within our high CO2 environment. But then we found that after sort of another year or so later, that it was basically dead and down to just the, the, the skeleton because finally the, the turf algae had started to overgrow it. And this was one of only three Acropora colonies we found. And when I say colonies, they're all tiny. And so we started to think a little bit more about these indirect effects that turf algae could have on the system. And so one of the things we were thinking about was, well, one of the very common traits of turf algae is that it traps huge amounts of sediment. And so if you look on this video on the right, when I move some of that turf algae out of the way, you can see thick plumes of sediment that are being scattered into the water. Once you look underneath that, obviously a little bit green, but you can see that it's basically bare rock. And so normally what happens is, is that this is a rocky reef. And so you have all the organisms, they want to settle on that rock. But if between the place they want to settle, there's then a thick layer of sand and a thick layer of turf algae, you're gonna have a real impact on those. And so as well as smothering any existing species, we kind of hypothesize that it might impact those that are trying to settle or trying to recruit into the system. And so we wanted to know therefore, okay, well, how bad are those conditions kind of at, you know, within the sediment, within the rock itself? You know, can we actually start to um, get some indication about what those environmental conditions are like? And so we took some small, water samples in situ within the sediment. So this is where you've got the rock, you have the sediment, you then have the turf algae we're normally seeing, took a sample within that, something at the, uh, the surface of the turf algae, so between the water and the turf, and then a sample higher up within the seawater, like two or three meters. And what we could see was that when we measured the pH within this, the dissolved oxygen and the aragonite saturation state, is that you're getting huge changes in this carbonate chemistry of the water. Now, bear in mind that this is all over about 10 centimeters or so, 10, 15 centimeters, that you're getting pH declines from 7.8, which is already our acidified conditions, to close to 7.2, which is way beyond what we expect for the end of the century. And so 
we know that anything trying to settle on the rock or within the sediment is going to have a really hard time because those conditions are just way outside of what they would normally be able to tolerate. Very similarly, we have the same pattern with the dissolved oxygen. This is approaching hypoxic conditions. So you're only going to have those species that can really actually tolerate these like bad conditions that are going to survive. When we look at the aragonite, so this is a, a metric for how available carbon ions are. Generally, if you have a number below one, that calcified structure is going to be passively dissolving. If the number is higher, then you have, well, the higher, the better, basically. And so generally, they think that you need it to be closer to sort of three or 3.5 if you want to have um, accretion of a coral reef, kind of 2.5 for sort of temperate calcifiers. It's very much controlled by acidification, but also temperature. So our dashed line in this figure is therefore showing that within the sediment, any calcified structure is going to be dissolving, and they're not going to be doing much better within the turf algae. So we figured that obviously there has to be some sort of biological process driving these changes in the microchemical environment. And so we took a few samples within that sediment and within the turf to look at the bacterial community. And so we saw that there was a big change when comparing the turf and the sediment. And so kind of as we expected, when you look within the sediment, you've got the types of bacteria that are very much associated with hypoxic and noxic conditions. So these are very much heterotrophic bacteria where clearly their respiration is just driving down the pH, driving down the oxygen. And overall, this means that they would be very much responsible for those changes in the conditions, so the pH, the oxygen, the saturation state. Now it's likely that because the turf algae there's so much biomass, they're probably fueling this bacteria as well. So we would expect that there'd be a lot of photosynthetic exudates will be released from this turf algae. It's then driving this bacteria and driving it down. And so it kind of means there's a, there's a number of things connecting together that allow this you know, turf to proliferate because they themselves seem to be quite happy with these bad conditions. So we figured that anything settling would be you know, badly impacted, but we wanted to test this. And so we put out a series of recruitment tiles in which we wanted to see within the high CO2, if there's a bunch of turf covering it, how does that impact the recruitment? If there's a little bit of turf, what happens? And if there's no turf, what happens? And so completely following what we thought, when you had coverage by turf, after four months, there was no other algae that was settling on that tile or as good as zero. When you only had like a minimal amount of turf around, you got decent recruitment. The available space was there. And so this was not some physiological limit of the acidified conditions. The coralline algae could settle. But if the little bit of turf or a lot of turf was there, it would actually inhibit it. So preventing that kind of succession going on. So this kind of starts to go, okay, so that's, you know, what's going on. So it seems to be that, you know, very directly turf algae can overgrow coral and other macroalgae, particularly smother them with, uh, with sediment, but they bring about conditions as well that benefit them because they don't care about the sediment or anything, but it really drives down everything else. And so this is what we consider to be a feedback loop. So this is a system which stabilizes the turf as being the dominant species by just bringing these different processes that all help it and negatively impact everything else. And these therefore seem to be that they then just lock this system in place. And so this is what we refer to as sort of hysteresis or an alternative stable state where it doesn't kind of matter what you do to these systems, it's gonna stay as a turf dominated system within this high CO2, which means for sort of ecosystem management or any sort of policy, it makes it really difficult to reverse these back to a kind of productive, diverse system. Now, one of the, uh, one of the other aspects we have, so obviously in Okinawa, you're gonna be far more familiar than I am with typhoons, but we increasingly are getting typhoons up where we are. So just to give you an idea on this scale, so Shikine 
is uh, about here where the, the where the marker is. And so we're increasingly getting typhoons that come up into this sort of temperate zone and cause big impacts. Now, generally, this disturbance to the community, how much of an impact it has is very much controlled by the community itself. We have a couple properties of these, which we call stability. And so you can have the two one main ones being resistance of the community. So how much they can kind of resist and tolerate any disturbance and the resilience, which is following a disturbance, how much they can kind of bounce back and recover. And so we sort of started to think that, well, if you've got this big change in the composition of the community between, you know, our normal present day, you know, diverse corals and algae and our very simplified and degraded turf, then presumably they must respond differently to disturbances. And, you know, what better disturbance to use than a massive typhoon? And so we decided to actually start tracking how the community was changing month by month over a three year period. So for almost every single month, we tracked a number of permanent quadrats. So this is where you assess the exact same place. So we, we marked them in the rock. You constantly, every month you're comparing the exact same place. So there's not any kind of differences because of the rock type or anything. And we see how the community changed over time. And particularly we focused on what the community is like before the typhoon, what happens after the typhoon, and then what happens like a bit after when they've had some chance to start to recover and kind of grow back a little bit. And so what we could see, so this is just a sort of simple one for percentage cover, is that in each of these, we have our, our before, the blue. So this is what it's like before, after, immediately after the typhoon, and our sort of yellow gold recovery a couple months later. So what you can see is on the left-hand side, yeah, there, there's an impact of a typhoon on the sort of present day communities. But when you look at these acidified communities, you're getting a much larger decline. You know, So whereas you're perhaps losing like, I don't know, 25% of the cover to you know, some pretty substantial typhoons, you're losing closer to 40%, 50%. You know, and in some cases, there's obviously examples where you have a near total reset. And so we're kind of like, OK, the ability of the community to resist this kind of disturbance, it's not bad in the present day. You know, you get some pretty sizable typhoons, you know, it's not too much of a change. But for those acidified communities, you're getting a lot more of that algae being lost. But given a couple months, they are actually recovering. So when you look at the blue compared to the yellow in all of these, it's about the same. So it means that despite the high CO2 having this, this less resistance, because you have more loss, so they can't deal with it, they can recover afterwards quite quickly. And so it suggests that their, their resistance is reduced, but perhaps their resilience there, how quickly they can recover, is actually maybe okay. Now, what we can then start to do is to look kind of within this community. So rather than just an overall percentage cover, we can get an idea of, okay, well, what kind of functional groups is this made up of? Um, because we already know the story where, you know, the, the high CO2 is, is made of turf. And, you know, we know this sort of side already. And so what we can see here, again, the blue before, the red being the impact and the yellow, the recovery, <coughs> is that the composition doesn't really change in the present day communities. So this just means just like a little bit of everything was lost, but you don't lose a particular group. So just every species goes down a bit in cover and then comes back up. But when you actually look at the high CO2, you have the, the red coloration as this out group. And that's because the species type that best describes it is bare rock. So when you have the impact in the high CO2, it is stripping back many times to just rock. And so it means that you're going to be going back to that kind of secondary succession. So back to that bare rock, which we already know from sort of my initial story, is going to end up at turf. You're going to have that just very simple like development of the community. And so we know that, therefore, they have this reduced stability 
because their high resilience within the high CO2, it only just goes back to turf. So yeah, they recover quickly, but they recover to a not very good state. You know, it's a low productivity degraded state. And so it means that the typhoons aren't causing the simplification, but they're helping to lock it in because you're just getting this reset and then the high CO with the ocean silvification community, it's just coming to a quite simple level, always a simple level. And this is kind of the best it can achieve. Now, one of the other sort of uh, ways in which we can start to control turf algae, the other sort of biological, ecologically driven aspect is top-down control. You know, normally in a typical system, particularly in the more tropical areas, Algae is controlled by grazing, whether it's by fish or urchins or other things, generally it's kept under control. And there usually has to be some upset to the system before that kind of changes. And so I therefore wanted to get an idea of whether the role of sea urchins is being affected when you start to look at sort of different CO2 seeps. Focus on sea urchins because they are not only a huge contributor to grazing, but they're a calcified organism. So there's some expectation that they are negatively impacted. So we carried out some experiments within our site in uh, Shikine in Japan, within Volcano Island. So this is a uh, Italian Sicilian CO2 seep and uh, with some colleagues at a, a white island within New Zealand. And we wanted to look at how the, whether the size, abundance, feeding rate and uh, sort of metabolic rates of the urchins were being affected. To try and get a handle on their role as, as top-down control. And so quite simply with the abundance, we could see that apart from perhaps the, uh, the Arbasia from Italy, generally we're seeing this, this decline in their abundance. So here again, we've got the blue as our reference and the red as our, our high CO2. So the urchins, clearly they're negatively impacted by OA, and so we find fewer of them. Whether this is directly or less habitat, you know, it's difficult to know, but generally they decline. When we then start to look at how much they eat, so in the top row we've got how much an average individual eats of uh, the same macroalgae. We generally see that, you know, for a, for a given, uh, so, you know, for a given individual, Generally, they're eating less food. So their ability to control the turf or other algae is generally reduced a bit. But obviously, if you're thinking about the control of urchins in general, you need to kind of combine together how many of them there are, how much they're eating, and kind of what size they are. And so we made a kind of population grazing rate metric of it. So we combined it all together, and we can see when you stuff it all together, you have quite big declines in their ability. So again, you know, you're seeing these big declines from the normal conditions to the high CO2, suggesting that on a normal day, the urchins can't control what's going on when they have the acidified conditions. But add to that, the turf is also boosting. So you've got your kind of turf is, is happily growing massively and the urchins just can't control it anymore. And so they kind of lose <coughs> that aspect. When we look into the fish, along with some uh, colleagues in uh, Italy, so Marco Rimelazzo and uh, Carlo Catano, we looked into how the fish changed within our Chikine site. Now, they looked into many of the, the traits of the fish to get some understanding of whether particular types of fish were you know, being lost or you know, functional traits. And generally, there were fewer tropical species, but more temperate and herbivoric species. The part of the reason for this loss of tropical species is because the ones we normally find, they're associated with a habitat. They live in a coral, they live in an anemone. When that is lost, they're no longer found within that turf environment. So it's kind of indirectly through this loss of habitat. But because you're having this therefore fewer tropical fish, it starts to raise the question whether you might actually have some impact of ocean acidification on tropicalization on the ability of them to actually you know, move into the more you know, warm affinity species to move into temperate waters. Now, we obviously therefore have a lack of grazers controlling our turf. And even the other fish, they're actually probably not helping with the spread of the turf. So this is a gill raking fish that will actually eat the turf 
for the invertebrates inside of it. It'll filter it within its gills, and then you'll actually see it then spits out the remaining turf afterwards. So you see it'll both push it through its gills and then spit out some remaining turf. So this is probably, it's my favorite species, I'll be honest. It's probably not helping because you can see that therefore you've got really turbid conditions where it's just launching turf algae and uh, diatoms into the water. And so, but you can kind of imagine how with, you know, clearly even fish, you know, there's going to be not that many fish that are actually grazing. Now, when we consider these kind of regime shifts, we're talking about this change from like the complex, you know, the, the, the coral reefs and the, the kelp forests to the turf. And there's obviously other species that do come in and do not care about the turf. But if you have any big complex algae, they are happy to eat it. So this was some uh, work that's predominantly led by my colleague, uh, Silvan Agostini. And he is looking into the fact that when you have kelp there, whether real or transplanted in, sort of a parrotfish or budai, will happily eat it in a matter of hours. They absolutely demolish it. And so this kind of means that we don't have any fish or urchins that can control the turf. And that turf is stopping any kind of corals or anything like this. But even if you have big algae, there's other fish that will happily eat it. And so all these kind of things are just driving down to make it a very simple system. So the work that, uh, that was uh, very much a thing of uh, my colleague Sylvan, as I said, was therefore perhaps you could compare our CO2 seep site. So where we actually have the, uh, the marked here is the OW, OAW, as a kind of warmed, and then in the seep, a warmed and acidified. And you could compare it to Shimoda, which is where our marine station is based. And the reason we can use this comparison is because when you look at the kelp within Shimoda, we still have kelp forests. We're still just temperate enough. And despite it only being quite a small distance into uh, Shikine, you've still got the complete loss of that kelp, but you've got the coral coming up. And so this kind of suggests that it's actually quite recently been tropicalized in Shikine, because when we spoke to fishermen 20 years ago, there was kelp. And so we know that this is very much an ongoing tropicalization. So he wanted to know if you put kelp back again, could they survive? You know, is, is there a problem? And as we already discovered with the Badai, no. We found that after about four hours, they'd eaten all of the kelp that was transplanted in. And so as soon as we go, they just were just left with some remaining holdfasts. So we're like, okay, yep, the kelp, that's not coming back. The corals, we're like, okay, when you have them in these warmer conditions, when you take them into uh, Shikine, it's a bit warmer than Shimoda. They're like that. It's, you know, they're obviously normally found in warmer waters, no problem. So here we've got just the growth of the Acropora species. It's, you know, generally in the, the, the colder months, you get better growth when you have these warmer conditions. But as soon as you add ocean acidification as well, it's lost again. And so any kind of tropicalization benefit for corals is likely to be hindered when you consider ocean acidification as well. And so overall, what this kind of means is that when we're considering our current temperate communities, you know, our kind of kelp dominated communities, if you consider warming alone, then yeah, they will probably shift to a coral type community because the kelp will be eaten by the budai or whatever grazing fish and the corals, they quite like it. They'll grow more. But if you consider acidification as well, the kelp's gone, the corals will go or decline and you're just gonna be left with a simple turf community. And so when we're kind of considering tropicalization, the, the context matters. So in kind of a summary for, for, for all of this, it means that ocean acidification is gonna represent quite widespread and global loss of complexity of the particularly sort of habitat and key habitat forming species. And then we're probably expecting more of a shift towards turf algae. <clears throat> there's going to be some kind of, you know, complicated uh, ecology playing a role, but generally there's a lot of things that kind of lock this system in place and make it much more difficult 
to reverse. Now, obviously, a lot of the um, work I presented today is associated or carried out predominantly at uh, our study site in Shikine. And so we're now, therefore, as part of a ongoing international collaboration, of which Tim and his group and Oyce in general are part, we're starting to try and go, all right, so we're seeing these patterns. Can we, if we actually look at these in like a few different systems, a few different places, and compare across multiple locations, are we seeing the same patterns or is it, you know, a little bit site specific? And so we're trying to go to like look at sort of like more and more different places. So this is a project that's uh, between, at the moment, three core countries. So of uh, Italy, led by uh, Marco Milazzo in Palermo, and uh, in uh, France, but particularly New Caledonia, in uh, Ricardo Rodolfo Matapa, and obviously a number of different institutes within Japan. And so we're trying to see if we can start to generalize some of these patterns. And as a super final one, just for the interest of some, so this week, we're starting to do a, a bit of playing around with the, the micro CT to see if we can uh, look at some stuff for, for myself. It's to try and uh, get a handle on uh, muscle species I'm working. So this was literally scan the data from like uh, yesterday. So there's nothing more than this, but just to give you an idea. So we're seeing obviously huge like dissolving damage on the muscles in the high CO2 compared to, to normal. And, uh, and uh, Ginter, master student who joined me here, is um, doing some work on a few of the coral species in which you can start to look at the internal structures and things like this. And so I will leave it there. Thank you very much for listening. Any question? Any question? Uh, yes, Charles? Yeah, have you tried to transplant tiles from uh, one environment to the other, you know, to swap the tiles and see what's yes. happening? Yep, uh, so I published something uh, earlier this year. So in uh, doing exactly this. Sorry. Doing exactly this. Um, so we, we looked at uh, the community tiles after six months and then did a reciprocal transplant. And we found that um, regardless of the community that it formed, uh, it would then go to the community you put it in. So for example, if you took a community that had six months in the control and then moved it to the high CO2 for six months, it went to turf. But if you took the turf from the high CO2 and brought it back, it could recover. And so ones that had been 12 months control or you know six months, six months, were mostly similar and mostly the other way. So this kind of has a positive connotation and a negative connotation. So the negative is even existing communities can be degraded. And the positive spin is if we can get the CO2 emissions under control, then it is possible for some of these um, systems to recover as long as you've got like you know the, the proper you know recruitment source but they can be recovered and it's likely driven by the associated community so the fact that when you bring back in like the lots of fish lots of the urchins and they're not under stress they once again control that turf and normal development can kind of recover any other questions the last question from uh, zoom yeah okay you can go ahead all right cool talk. yeah ben uh -oh. can you hear me yep right on cool super cool talk thank you very much um i really liked the uh coralline algae and the diversity and how a lot of stuff had been missed that's uh i think something that's pretty important and i have a related question it's it's not related to coralline algae but it's along the same sort of thought line um so I have a couple of colleagues here that uh, specialize in algae and they're always asking turf algae presenters. So I'm gonna do the same to you today. Um, is turf algae, have you looked at the components inside the turf algae at all? Uh, yes. Uh, so although we do get a bit of a, uh, a, a mix for it, um, ours is yeah. actually, um, it, in fact, actually the, 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 the photo shown right now is probably the best example. Is actually large part is a diatom. There's a, a diatom, uh, Badolfia badolfiana, um, which is a benthic diatom. So it uh, actually forms a large majority of this. Okay, um, and so and, and yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. So and like, have you um, 
can you compare like the, with the turf algae, say in a, in a control or in a normal site, or for example, even in a subtropical site? Because a lot, of, I know a lot of people and in, myself included, when we do ecology, we're like, ah, turf algae, turf algae, turf algae. But just like the coralline algae, you, I think you mm -hmm. really have to start teasing apart what's inside there. Yes, I, I fully agree. And it's actually uh, an ongoing plan um, because uh, even when you talk to a temperate ecologist compared to a tropical ecologist, their definition of turf will shift. And so for many yeah. tropical, yeah. they'll consider it a few millimeters, whereas for many temperate, it might be five or 10 centimeters. And so actually yeah, that... one of the things I was hoping to start in Iwatori was to start mm. to quantify the turf fully, exactly as you said. Yeah, so, yeah, definitely. Because I mean, yeah, looking yeah. at that, that looks a lot more like, um, you know, looks very different than the turf I'm used to. So I was super curious about that. Cool. We'll talk more later, but yeah. super cool. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you. Any question from you? Are there so, direct do, benefits to the turf algae of the low pH? For example, it starts to proliferate like this. Is mm -hmm. it only because there's not as much competition and there's reduced grazing, or is there an actual direct benefit of the conditions for the turf algae itself? Uh, as in the, the, the OA benefiting the... Turf algae. <coughs> yeah. Does it somehow have a direct... It does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll repeat that just in case on, on Zoom of whether they can hear your voice or not. Uh, so it was just asked whether or not there was a direct effect of ocean acidification on the turf algae itself. And yes, um, we actually done, did some measurements in which we took... Um, the turf algae from a number of locations within the high CO2 area, so of different PCO2, and uh, using uh, PAM, we, we assessed their sort of photosynthetic efficiency. And we actually found that there were some increases where generally, um, even within the same species, that generally they were better at, well, more efficient, I don't wanna say better, but more efficient in uh, some parameters um, with the, the, the CO2. Um, and so I would guess that it's kind of a little bit of a competition where they are better, they benefit from whether it's the CO2 or the bicarbonate, I don't know, but they benefit from OA and then probably also are competing with things that are negatively impacted. So they kind of boosted and therefore become better competitors. So, thank you. Yeah, Michael. And do you think if you introduced a complex structure like an artificial reef or something that somehow recruited more fish and grazers, would they be able to then kind of, I mean, it would depend, of course, on if the ones that you want come in, mm -hmm. but do you think that would somehow be able to like compensate that turf or just? It, it would, um, sorry, I did the same again. So whether or not an uh, artificial structure could be brought in to promote the availability of fish or other grazers and whether that would be sufficient to control the turf algae. Um, it, it's a tricky balance because the, you, you have to think about it from two different aspects. One is whether that, well, for simplicity we'll say fish, but whether that fish is being negatively impacted physiologically by the OA, and that is what's preventing it from staying, or whether it is a limitation of habitat. So if it's a limitation of habitat and you provide an artificial habitat for them, then that might be a way to bring them in and promote the uh, some control of the turf algae. And obviously given enough, then it might be possible to almost feed back a bit where their presence controls the turf, which then stops the turf being a problem. Um, but the problem is, is whether the habitat is not a problem, but they're physiologically impacted or, you know, they're, or they're, perhaps their food source is not available, then it might not be enough. But certainly there could be some possibility and we're starting to look into introducing some artificial structures we're actually working with a, uh, a a team that works on metamaterials in france on a similar kind of thing one question from the zoom please go ahead all right sorry it's me again ben i'm your worst nightmare um <laughs> all right my other question was uh it's more it's more of a comment but it's actually really interesting um and it might be something you want to check out uh, we've noticed in tropical and subtropical areas, sometimes you have, uh, whether it's permanent or, temp or temporal is, is uncertain, but we have uh, shifts to terpios, which is a cyanobacterial sponge that pretty much encrusts the whole reef and can take over a site really strongly. 
Um, but we get the same thing. When a typhoon blows through, it disappears for a few months. You get a cyanobacterial bloom, and then the terpios comes back in a few months. So do you, my question to you is, do you think there's a general pattern with these sort of degraded and more simple sort of encrusting um, communities that they, they share some common traits with being able to bounce back quickly and also being heavily disturbed by mechanical damage? Or is this just luck of the draw? No, I, 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 I do agree. I, I, I would, uh, so although it's kind of a little bit old school ecology, I, I think the kind of concept of R selected versus K selected uh, would actually strongly pay a role because um, mm. those species that are able to come in most efficiently are going to be the ones that are the opportunistic, fast growing, fast reproducing um, species. And so um, it's commonly observed, particularly within the temperate, obviously that that's turf, but it, it doesn't mean that it has to be, um, you know, algae or anything like that. So I, yeah, I, I, I would imagine that in a sort of very similar way that the sort of what you were seeing as the observation was that the, uh, the, the, the ground was cleared as it were by the typhoon. And this gave the opportunity for those opportunistic species to yeah, come in. Under under certain yeah. stressed conditions. So you could almost, you know, could yeah. almost probably write a review or something on all the, the different sort of degraded communities that you come across and how they all share mm -hmm. these classic, you know, um, taking advantage of a disturbed uh, environment under non, you know, with hashtags, non-normal conditions, so to speak, or yeah. new normal or whatever you want to call it. We can talk more after. Yeah. I think there's something, yeah. I think there's something there cool to do. Yeah, no, I think, I think we're good. We, we, we've actually, because um, my other sort of research is on uh, marine heat waves, and we actually see the same patterns within warming and mm. heat waves. When you get that uh, shift to the simplified and the loss of the complex, and so this kind of global simplification, I think, has uh, got some merit. Well, I mean, you could so, even yeah. extend it to you know with heat waves and coral reefs, and you're losing all your branching, and you're keeping a lot of your your sort of encrusting or, or massive corals, even if you wanted to extend it further. Yeah. There's definitely yeah, something there we're something. talking about. Yeah, I mean, even within the CO2 seeps within PNG, it went to massive varieties off the top of my head. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. All right. We'll talk more later. This is cool. I'm excited. Right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so time for one more question. Uh, there is anyone from Zoom? No? Well, then I asked the last question. So I was curious about uh, the Python mm -hmm. situation. So you showed that uh, involved control and CO2, the community, then, but, you know, if you give it time, mm -hmm. two months, they kind of go back. Yeah. Right, but maybe I missed it. Did you measure the productivity after the typhoon? The we couldn't do it because it's uh, very much in in situ. So it, okay, it's okay. Um, so it's quadrats, so uh, fifty by fifty centimeters. Okay. It's sort of fixed position, and so it's seeing how exactly the same rock goes. Um, so, but we we I think it would be something that would be yeah, super interesting. Really interesting. Um, yeah. And so yeah, so as you may know, so Wadasan, my yeah. colleague within yeah. the center. So he he has uh, some, I mean, obviously lots of research places have them, but some nice uh, chambers, flexible chambers that you can measure the productivity in situ. So he's basically got a cheap version. So it's just a DO meter with a really, really long cable where you leave the meter floating on the surface. And then you can start to do some things to change. So yeah, it would be super, super interesting. I agree. Really great. Thank you. So uh, let's thank one more time, Ben. Then tomorrow here in uh, with us, and we'll come back for sure for this discussion and other things. So um, feel free to talk to him sitting over here in uh, Lab Four. Uh, and also thank you everyone from joining via Zoom. And you guys, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.